Well, good evening. Uh, I am Faye Rosenfeld, the Director of Programs at the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's program about the Common Core Standards, a topic that is of enormous importance as we consider ways to prepare our students to be competitive in the global economy. We are gathered for this conversation in the historic home of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, which has been a setting for discussions about important policy issues for over a century. For those of you who have not heard the story, FDR's mother, Sarah Delano Roosevelt, built this double townhouse as a present for Franklin and Eleanor shortly after they were married. And in what was not always the most ideal living arrangement, Sarah lived in one half of the house and the young couple in the other half. Now the Roosevelt family lived here off and on from the time they moved in in 1908 until FDR became president in 1933 with Sarah remaining here until her death in 1941. And during that period, uh, the house was the site of many events, large and small, that helped shape the course of the 20th century. It is the place where FDR recuperated from polio and planned his campaigns for governor and president. In his library on the second floor, which I hope you'll all have a chance to visit, um, he, FDR met with his advisors to begin planning the New Deal and offered cabinet positions to Francis Perkins and others. And this is where Eleanor Roosevelt met with civic leaders and educators such as Mary McLeod Bethune and where she launched her own career as a human rights activist. It's very fitting that the new CUNY Institute for Education Policy, led by Dave, Dean David Steiner, from whom you'll be hearing shortly, has its home here at Roosevelt House. Not only was Eleanor Roosevelt herself a teacher, but the Roosevelts were great believers in the importance of education as a fundamental building block of an informed democracy. In FDR's words, democracy cannot succeed unless those who express their choice are prepared to choose widely, wisely. The real safeguard of democracy, therefore, is education. Indeed, the Roosevelt's commitment to education is what made it possible for all of us to be sitting here this evening. During the time they lived here and even after FDR became president, the Roosevelts were great friends to Hunter College, whose main campus is just three blocks away. FDR came to Hunter to dedicate the main building on Park Avenue, which was built with, F with WPA funds in 1940. And Eleanor was a frequent speaker at academic functions, and she took a personal interest in many Hunter students, mentoring them, and even going so far as to invite the class president of 1942 to lunch at the White House with Winston Churchill. After, it's true. After Sarah died in 1941, the Roosevelts decided that Hunter College should acquire this house so that it could serve as the nation's first student center dedicated to interfaith and interracial understanding, a center that FDR said he hoped would serve as a model for educational institutions across the land. The house flourished as a student center for nearly 50 years, but gradually fell into physical disrepair and was closed down completely in 1992 in need of total restoration. Under the leadership of Hunter's president, Jennifer Rabb, we were proud to restore and reopen the house in 2010. It is now the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute at Hunter College, dedicated to honoring the Roosevelt legacy through teaching, research, and public dialogue about the most important issues of the day. Our students have access to two extraordinary undergraduate academic programs, one in public policy and the other in human rights. Our faculty members engage in applied research projects and organize conferences, seminars, and convenings, such as the one you're attending this evening. And we invite the public to join us for free events with some of the leading authors and speakers in the country. Um, and we actually have a handout upstairs if anyone's interested in coming. We have Ira Katz Nelson speaking here on Monday evening about his new book on the New Deal, which was just reviewed in The New Yorker this week, and a major conference on the presidency of Eisenhower that's taking place on Thursday and Friday of next week. So we hope you can join us. Um, and so we're really delighted that you're here with us this evening at Roosevelt House, um, and we do hope that you'll join us again in the future. And um, it's now my pleasure to turn the microphone over to my colleague Peter Mayer, who's a program director here at the Institute, um, and who will moderate this evening's discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Faye. Thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, I think I would have liked the uh, cocktail hour to go on a little longer because I was having some very interesting conversations and um, it's fascinating so I hope we, I, I am anticipating a lot of great questions from the audience tonight. Uh, 
Welcome to this fabulous house. I'm Peter Meyer, Program Director, the CUNY Institute for Education Policy at Roosevelt House, and the moderator of tonight's discussion. We are new, and we are extremely excited by the challenges of helping America better educate its children. As our mission statement says, we are New York's first university-based policy analysis and research institute devoted solely to understanding the challenges of PK-20 education. A tall order. And we will begin tackling it tonight, discussing a subject that has, as education journalist Robert Rothman says of the Common Core State Standards, the potential to transform American education. Have we heard that before? <laughs> the other day, Eric Hanyushek, the education economist who is taking Diane Ravage's place on the popular Bridging Differences blog, said that no child left behind, remember that? Was, quote, arguably the most significant change in education policy of the past half century. A couple of years ago, Rick Hess, who heads up the American Enterprise Institute's education division, called Race to the Top, Barack Obama's answer to George Bush's NCLB, quote, arguably the most visible and celebrated school reform effort in American history. Interestingly, before he called the Common Core Standards potentially transformative, Rothman called the idea of national education standards, quote, the third rail of education policy. Nobody wanted to touch them, and they didn't. Well. Some folks tried with history standards in the 1990s, and that ended with the United States Senate voting 99 to 1 to kill the standards. How we got from third rail to transformative is an interesting story, but we're here tonight to discuss whether, in fact, the English language arts standards will, in fact, transform our public schools. Like it or not, these standards are coming to a classroom near you very soon. In fact, nearly three million classrooms. 45 states and the District of Columbia have adopted them and teachers all over the country are working feverishly to begin teaching them this fall. In fact, tonight's conversation, which will focus on the theory of the ELA standards and their potential impact in high schools, is the first in a series of discussions about the Common Core. For our next event in the series, we will hear from classroom teachers and administrators about how things look in the field, or sometimes, some people refer to it as the trenches. Stay tuned. Please visit our website. The address is on the back of your program uh, to learn more about our new venture and future programs. And before we begin tonight, I would like to introduce a few members of our team. Lily Raby, our event planner, who has a master's degree from New York University in theater education, but for this job has mastered the art of constant contact mailing lists and more formidably snagging New York City liquor licenses. <laughs> Thank you, Lily. Daniel Reed, chief of staff to David Steiner and director of strategic planning at the Hunter College School of Education. If you know David Steiner, you, who, who you'll meet in a moment, you know that you have to have several degrees and a proficiency in juggling for that job. And Daniel's got them. University of Virginia, late Yale Law School, McKinsey and Company. Thank you, Daniel. Finally, David Steiner, who launched this ship and will be on stage here in a moment, is. I met David while reporting a story for Education Next, and I wrote in that piece, that with a philosophy degree from Oxford and a doctorate in political science from Harvard and following stints at the National Ed Endowment for the Arts and Boston University School of Education and Dean of Hunter College School of Education, he became Commissioner of Education for New York State. He was plucked, David's word, from academia by New York State Education Chancellor Merrill Tisch to, quote, plant a vision to find the funding for it, and to launch a radical reformation of the New York education system. As, um, and he charged out of the gate, instituting tougher benchmarks for the state's grade, grade three through eight tests, initiating a major effort to write a statewide curriculum, and leading the charge to win a berth in the race to the top's winner circle, 
securing the state a cool 700 million to implement a series of educational reforms, including the Common Core State Standards. A major part of that effort was securing support for the Common Core State Standards. I had not met Mark Bowerling, a professor of English at Emory University, before today, but I had met his writing. It is sharp, elegant, and wonderfully succinct. Like these sentences from his book, The Dumbest Generation, How the Digital Age Stupefies Young Americans and Je Jeopardizes Our Future. Quote, teenagers live in the present and the immediate. What happened long ago and far away doesn't impress them. They care about what occurred last week in the cafeteria, not what took place during the Great Depression. They heed the words of Facebook, not the Gettysburg Address. They focus on other kids in English class, not leaders in Congress. I wonder what Mark thinks of the Common Core Standards. The book, which Harold Bloom called, quote, an urgent and pragmatic book on the very dark topic of the virtual end of reading among the young, will be available at the table at the front entry of uh, the building tonight. And if you can snag Mark, he'll probably uh, autograph it for you. And Mark also, uh, who also chaired the English Commission for the College Board, Last, last fall co-authored with Sandra Stotsky a report for the Pioneer Institute called How Common Core's ELA Standards Place College Readiness at Risk. Do we think Mark has doubts about the Common Core? Now, since I once played Ed Sullivan at a community theater production, don't ask, uh, on with the shoe. I'll ask Mark and David to join me, and they're already here, they're on center stage, to begin what I know will be a lively, informative, and friendly discussion between Mark and David. And somewhere around 7.10, we will open things up to the audience for your questions about whether the ELA Common Core Standards will be the path to a better educated America. Another during the discussion. Um, and as I mentioned, we will make time for audience questions later. I want to begin by introducing another person to the discussion. We have a very short video clip of David Coleman, one of the chief architects of the Common Core, and now president of the College Board, talking about the primary goal of the standards that, that of making students college and career ready. A group of us developed the Common Core very much with the problem that you began with in mind. That is, what you described in New York State is true widely in the country. There's been advances in improving graduation rates, but the very disappointing news that that improvement in graduation rates often is without many more kids being truly ready for the demands of college and career, which, as you said, terribly means that they wind up in remediation courses. I don't think we need to make a case for the seriousness of our students lack of preparedness for college, but feel free to do so. I, I think, let's get right to the question which David introduced. Will the ELA Common Core make more of our students truly college and career ready? Mark, go ahead. Start? Well, <clears throat> the problem is, is serious in terms of career readiness. Uh, ACT does the uh, measurement each year, the, the exams uh, in four subjects in my world of reading, uh, we're stuck at about 50% of students who take the ACT are not determined as college ready. College ready is the likelihood of being able to get a, somewhere around a B in a first year English course. And one, uh, one saw for many years the focus on access to college, getting students into college. And, what, what, what David Coleman said is, is correct. Too many students were getting into college and then ending up uh, with the bad news that they took a diagnostic test a few weeks before matriculating and finding that if you go into a freshman comp course, you're going to fail. So let's put you in remediation. And then when they looked at the students who did take any remedial courses, the retention rate was sometimes in the teens uh, for those students. So the emphasis was not only getting students into college, but keeping them in college, and so that was the, the, the motivation moving backward 
into the into the high school, primarily high school curriculum, and then and then farther down. For for my take on the standards, there there are some. I'll go ahead and identify a few problems that I found in the standards in in the report that Sandy Stotsky and I did. Uh, one that uh, has been often in the news has been related to the absence of sufficient amount of literary historical material in the standards. I'll just give a quick example. We do have a strong standard in the reading uh, strand that says demonstrate knowledge of 18th, 19th, and early 20th century foundational works of American literature. It's good. That's strong. How assessments will be developed out of that is, is, uh, is an open question, but uh, it's something that does prompt English teachers to develop something along the lines of a course in the tradition of great American writing. We don't have anything like that, however, in British literature. We have Shakespeare. We want one Shakespeare play listed, nothing else listed in British literature. And I would like to see a standard that says the same thing, demonstrate knowledge of, uh, let's go to 17th, 18th, 19th, and early 20th century uh, uh, British literature. Uh, without that standard, uh, it's uh, my worry is that literary historical knowledge is going to be lost in all the other things that one finds in, in Common Core. Uh, that, that, that's one thing. Uh, the next thing that college readiness uh, brings uh, to bear upon is the idea that in the average college curriculum that students take, literature is a pretty small portion of the readings that they engage in. And this led them into this percentage. The curriculum in English and history and science and social studies is going to be 70% informational, or sometimes they say nonfiction, and then 30% fiction. And in the English high school class, about 50-50. This has been the big, uh, big controversy in, in recent months. And I think it was just a mistake for them to select percentages, to come out with sort of hard and fast numbers. I mean, think about it. If you've got a 70-30 for the whole curriculum, and English has to be 50-50, if you take the other courses in which students are reading texts, English is about 25%, 20, maybe 30% of the readings that they will do will be in English. Think about that. Okay. In all the other classes, it's all nonfiction and informational. English is going to have to teach all the 30% on the whole curriculum. How does English then have 50% informational? It, it, the, the numbers don't add up. Uh, put it up. And, and I, 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 I just <laughs> raise that as if you, if you start bringing That's the, math, the, yeah. the percentages <laughs> uh, into this, you, you, you're, just, you're just asking for, uh, for, for controversy. Uh, so I, I, I think that was, that was probably a, a, a miscalculation. And finally, I'll say, we, we talk about the implementation. Common Core does contain some strong standards, literary historical standards, writing standards. Uh, th th they are there, but uh, Common Core does not include the machinery to ensure that as we align curricula with those standards, we end up with strong curricula, that would parallel the, the strong uh, the strong standards themselves. We, we've got a process here where we have a document, and all the states, and New York, I'll uh, let, let, let uh, uh, the, the recent announcement talk about, but they're trying to develop curricula, lesson plans, modules. I've seen some of these. Some of them are very strong. Some of them actually uh, uh, contravene Common Core's actual stated intentions. And so in that process of moving from these fairly abstract standards, the learning outcomes to what actual books, what assignments are going to end up in the classroom. We, we, we've, got a, we've got a process here, and I'm not sure who is watching or what is the mechanism by which someone can say, look, these lesson plans you're developing do not align with Common Core. So that, 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 those, I, I think, are, are dangers here. So that's a yes or a no? <laughs> will, it's, we, it's, will, we, will, the, will the Common Core, as you read them, make our kids more college and career ready or not? What do you think? In, 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 some, in some areas where the curriculum are developed in rigorous ways, they will. In some areas where they aren't, they won't. And Common Core itself does not 
have the, the leverage to ensure the, the, the first. Okay. David? Uh, well, it can't. Um, and the reason it can't is that this country, unlike many European countries, unlike Far Eastern countries, historically was created as a country that resisted authoritarian, centralized content for deep political and democratic reasons. It is not an accident that the Constitution leaves these matters to the states because the country was founded, after all, by many who were escaping from the persecution of those who took central ideas too seriously. What the Common Core does is to respond to the huge gap between high school graduation standards and college ready standards by saying that instead of building standards from kindergarten forward, we will build standards as we should from college and career ready back. That is the right impulse. Um, this year, the remediation rate at CUNY's community colleges, that means students who got their high school diploma and came to a community college is over 80%. There is an enormous gap. That's not, Why? that means not, that, that's the same way of saying that's not college ready. That's not right? college ready. No. So the question is not whether the Common Core solves all of our problems. It cannot. It cannot because it can only go so far given our political history. It can establish a staircase of complexity, to, to quote the core, in skills. What it tries to do is go as far as it can also in content and knowledge. And it does so in a rather subtle way. Instead of doing the impossible, which would be to set out the way we do in England or in Germany or in France or in other countries, a content in reading, right? You will read the following Shakespeare plays and they will change next year. You will read George Eliot. Next year it will be Fitzgerald, which we cannot do in this country at a national level. It says instead, you will do a certain amount of your reading that will count for Common Core in history, social studies, and in the sciences. It is making an effort to say to the teachers of the United States, for the first time, you need to get together and think through a connected curriculum. That is as far as the Common Core standards could go to incorporate E.D. Hirsch's brilliant thinking that says our ability to read well, particularly for underprivileged children, depends on the background knowledge we bring to our vocabulary and our texts. So where the Common Core couldn't tread, which was to give us a really full content curriculum, it tiptoes up to the edge with its reference to Shakespeare, its reference to 19th, 18th century literature, its reference to the founding texts. And then it says, and by the way, this is no longer just an English teacher's problem. This is a challenge to the whole school, to the whole district, to think about interconnected curriculum, knowledge-based curriculum. That's as far as it could go. So you said several times that we, we can't do curriculum, it's very specific curriculum. Is, is that because of it's, 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 well, we know the feds can't, it's, it's against the law for the federal, for the feds it's, to dictate it, but is, is the rest of the can't part of our national DNA? Yes, um, when, I, I, when I was in Boston, it was the Civil War. I think it still is in New York City. When I was in Washington, D.C., working with Mark at the National Endowment for the Arts, it was the war between the states. When I was in Tennessee, colleague Eric Koch, also there, it was the war of northern aggression. You cannot have three <laughs> wars that are one war and one curriculum. Right? Um, at best, you can do it at the state level, even at the state level. If David Coleman and his colleagues had announced that there was a set series of texts, the thing would have been dead on arrival. And if my uh, old boss, Merrill Tisch, this morning making reference, and about two hours ago, the city of New York choosing curriculum, as it did, big announcement this afternoon, Common Core aligned curriculum, if those curriculum were made up of set texts, they would be dead on arrival. So we have a deep cultural situation. And in my view, the Common Core, and we'll come back to it, I do have issues with it, but fundamentally, it is an extraordinary document because it takes us further than we've ever gone before. So my next question was going to be phrasing this in a little different light, which is whether 
the Common Core better than what we have? And you obviously just answered that question. So let me ask you a, a more specific question uh, about your, your days in the, as commissioner. And, and, and you got everybody to sign on to the Common Core. Do you have any regrets about any part of that? And, and would you do anything differently? No, I, I think it was the right thing to do. I, and I, I absolutely think it was the right thing to do. I do have some uh, issues with the particular theory of reading that's embedded in the Common Core. Again, fundamentally, what David Coleman and his colleagues did strikes me as right. That is, they noticed that tremendous habit in many American schools, and this is not the teacher's fault. This is a result of the history that I described, a result of textbook politics and many other things. But there had more and more, there was more and more evidence that there was a kind of institutionalized narcissism, by which I mean me, myself, and I. Um, <laughs> the student's 18th time writing the essay about my summer holiday, my reaction to the text, how I feel, how does this make you feel? A desperate search for relevance instead of introducing the student to imaginary and extraordinary worlds that they had never been able to enter. And I think that. David is absolutely right that we have to slow down and actually reintroduce our students to texts. And I, I think that because I saw that as the core of the core and because the experts that we brought to the state and other commissioners, my colleagues in other states brought to their commissionerships in mathematics where I'm absolutely not an expert, uh, the, the general judgment of people I respected was that the math standards were strong also. It's interesting, by the way, you said 45 states Actually, 46 states adopted the ELA standards, okay. uh, Minnesota included. Minnesota turned down the math standards for yeah. complicated reasons. But I do think that that focus in ELA on privileging the text is a vital corrective to too many practices in which the student had become the center um, and the text had disappeared. Mark, you just wrote a piece on this very question about the what David just referred to as sort of the narciss narcissistic approach to, to writing and reading. Do you, do you want to elaborate a little bit and then follow up, uh, if you could, answer the question of whether you think the ELA Common Core are better than what we have now? Uh, yeah, let, let me just <coughs> mention one thing, uh, what, what David said about local control. There, there was uh, a report that, that Peter sent around recently about how states are doing with developing curricular materials. And as they looked at the states, a lot of things are going on in, in, in many places, but there was one area where they saw there, there, there is a, a stumbling block, and here's what they said. States 2012 responses about Common Core implementation planning in the area of curriculum development reveal a heightened sensitivity around the balance between local and state control. So it's not just federal and state, but it's actually state and local yep. uh, as well. And here is how state, many states are really resolving that. Uh, they say here, uh, these findings underscore the technical and political complexities of state efforts to find an acceptable balance somewhere between imposing a standardized curriculum and leaving districts and teachers, well, teachers themselves, to find or develop their own materials. So what states are doing is they're, they're developing model lesson plans and, and, and sort of offering them and letting districts and teachers select uh, from them. So it's, it's just it's trying to find a way to, to, to do a balancing act to finesse uh, this sensitivity, to get strong curricula, but still try to preserve, uh, pr preserve uh, uh, the prerogatives a at the local level. OK, uh, but on the, on the uh, let's just say, the expressivistic uh, approach toward, toward students' uh, uh, work in, in English language arts, uh, this, this is certainly a, a common one, and Common Core uh, uh, clearly tried to discourage that by emphasizing uh, one, argumentative uh, writing and informational writing, and I think this could be also something that lies behind the rise in nonfiction and informational okay. text as well. Somehow they, they, they believe that the literary material is more conducive to the personal response kind of essay. How do you feel about this? What is your response to this? Hard to do, the, do that with, uh, with, with an op-ed, uh, for instance. But I'm just going to give you some examples. I looked through some materials created in Georgia that for middle school that are aligned with Common Core, putatively, 
And here are some of the assignments uh, that they did in one unit on society and individuality. Uh, here, one assignment is describe how you would feel and what your reactions would be if you had to live in a community in which everyone was the same. They'd read a book about conformity. Uh, uh, how would you feel? Not analyze the nature of conformity, social relations, and, and different, but how would you feel about this? What would your experience be? These are 13 year olds. Uh, ask them to, to, to imagine an experience that they've never come, come close to. Uh, here, here is one. In Harrison Bergeron, a, a, a story, social equality has been achieved through handicaps imposed upon the people by the handicapper general. Describe in your own words what it would be like to be a young pe person living through this kind of treatment and right. experiencing these experiences. The, the, the problem here is that we have 54, 60 million school students and two to three million teachers who, through no fault of their own, have been and test makers and superintendents and, super, and even state commissioners who have been in a given intellectual academic context for many years. The Common Core tries to, in one fell swoop, flick a switch and say that the kind of examples you've just read are utterly out of bounds in common core terms. They clearly are. Uh, if David Coleman were here, he would throw those questions in the dustbin. So I think part of the challenge here is we have an enormous professional development issue all the way through the system. Um, I had the privilege of working with a few teachers in New York City recently. I used the Mayflower Compact as the text because the teachers had used it. And these are very fine teachers. And we use the first line, in the name of God, comma, amen. And I asked whether any of the teachers had any difficulty with that sentence. And I had done my little spiel about the Common Core, and they'd had earlier spiels about the Common Core and about slow reading and careful reading. And there was, you know, they, they were almost insulted by my question. Um, what could be easier? So I said, that's wonderful, so you all know the etymology of the word amen, its ambiguity, why it's at the front of the text and not at the back. And there was this dead silence. And after two hours of discussion about the idea of let it be, may it be the case, maybe it's God's will that it be the case, maybe the minority of the pilgrims are appealing to God that it be the case to make up for the fact that they're not a majority, a very rich discussion with the teachers. They said to me afterwards, you know, that, now we begin to see what this is about. So the test makers in Georgia that you cite, the, and I don't, I'm nothing against Georgia. Um, they, are, they are not worse than any of the rest of us in, in this journey. They're all, we're all starting together. We have an enormous shift to make to take seriously the admonition to evidence-based careful reading. Uh, and I, I think we're gonna make a lot of mistakes and it's very hard the Gettysburg Address, to start with the actual language. And do we trust the text enough not to overframe it? Do we go to the paraphrase? Do we, right? All of those habits are very deeply ingrained. So I'm not surprised that we're getting it wrong. So we, we, we agree that generally the ELA comics course standards are better than what we've got. Or the what we, what we think we have in the... Uh, they will the be, um, but I think it's naive to think that you can flick a switch because you have a set of words on a page. So Kate, I, I spoke with Kate Walsh the other day. She's the head of the National Council on Teacher Quality. And she told me that the standards have created, quote, chaos in the states. I think this gets to your, your question of professional development and what's, how this is. The other, uh, just the other day, Education Week ran a story headline teachers unprepared for Common Core. So how much of this improvement that we may or may not see in the classroom depends on implementation and then how do we go about, how do you, how do you think that switch is going to be Look, it's everything. Flicked? We had standards in California, um, very overt, transparent, teachers were measured on it, this is years ago, um, and nothing changed because the teachers got no professional support. Right. Uh, to really implement them. 
Um, look, if no, no one helps us change habits, we don't change habits. I don't believe that you can simply, out of fear, force substantial change of professional habit, nor should you. you. We have a lot of work to do. The professional development challenge is daunting. In New York, uh, we have network teams that were funded from Race the Top. Um, we have teams for every 25 schools. There's still a whispering game, right? I heard from, she, she heard from you. By the time it gets to the individual teacher in her classroom, you have a lot of miscommunication. Um, you know, the, the groups of folks who've worked on the Common Core Standards can't be everywhere. They train the trainers who train the trainers who train somebody who then goes to a district, who then goes to a school, who then goes to a classroom. Um, this is, we're gonna be tested in our patience for this. Testing is just the word I was gonna bring up. <laughs> so, the mechanism for ensuring that we do or don't do these things, because we can't have a cop in every classroom, is, we? <laughs> uh, is, I think, and tell me if there are more mechanisms for doing this, the assessments, and the, 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 we have two commissions working on uh, the CC, the Common Core Standard Assessments uh, now, and um, yeah. teacher evaluations, which I know you've, you, you helped uh, re help rewrite and put value added into teacher evaluations. New York City is still holding out as, I, as far as I know. So are those two, are those two kinds of no, accountability measures at all? They don't help? They, they, they may help, but they're not the core of the matter. The core of the matter are, are teachers working together as professionals, um, thinking about these new approaches, thinking about what it means for their teaching and curriculum, and that is not a two-minute drill. We are a very impatient nation when it comes to education reform. Tayek and Cuban wrote a book about this called Tinkering Towards Utopia, where they show that you, you kind of lurch to one extreme and you lose patience in two minutes and then you lurch to the other before the either extreme has any chance to have any positive impact. Um, and the result is the kind of chaos you're talking about. So we are gonna have to be patient. Comments? Yeah, let me, let me say a word about, about the teachers and, and habits. You know, I'm, I'm teaching at the, at the college level, but I teach freshmen every semester. So I'm, I'm getting students three months after they've loved high school. But you know, I've, I've taught for many years and, and taught dozens of classes. And if, if someone just came in and said, no, this is wrong, you're doing this in the wrong way, you have to change your habits. I, you know, my, my first response is, I'm there, you're not. And uh, I try experiments all the time. I see things that work. Other things don't work, different classes. I, I, I see this worked this time, it didn't work. This time. So I'm, I'm constantly engaged in a, in a trial and error uh, process. And unless someone comes to me and offers <clears throat> something in a, in a constructive fashion and gives a lot of support, I'm, I'm, I'm disinclined to do well, one more thing that, that I have to change. And so I think that the professional development issue is is crucial, especially when we look at this new informational demand, because a lot of English teachers were, were, they were English majors. They, they grew up reading mostly literature. They went in because they, they loved uh, Jane Eyre and, and the great Gatsby. And their, uh, their, primary, their primary reading material has been literary. And the new informational demand uh, is not going to be uh, as large a reservoir that they have on hand as their literary reservoir. And so I think here, uh, with the informational, is a, is a crucial professional development issue. We need, we need places like, like, like Hunter to do professional development for informational texts. And, and it has to be things not like what we see in, in the text exemplar uh, fashion in Common Core, where they give you examples. Those are good informational nonfiction texts. But they're, they're isolated. There needs to be an integration of the informational and literary text that pre-exists the teacher's activity. Uh, we can satisfy the informational demand by uh, taking, we were talking, gave David an example earlier, if you want to teach the House, uh, the House of Mirth or the Age of Innocence, Edith Wharton's novels in 12th grade, those are, those are good texts to choose. 
well, you've got an informational demand, well, you should go to Edith Wharton's memoir, A Backward Glance. Read the first three or four chapters about growing up in this Gilded Age New York, or read a little Mark Twain on the Gilded Age. You have satisfied the informational requirement, but you're making a richer, a richer literary historical context for I, I those novels. Just intercede yeah. there. That is, I think, the dream. Um, imagine the Great Gatsby taught in the ELA classroom, the Jazz Age, not only taught as a piece of social history, but also in the music uh, department. Um, imagine these cross-disciplinary approaches. I, I honestly think that's some years away. Uh, we are not structured that way, and our assessments aren't structured that way. And I, I think we'll, we'll come back to the tests in a moment, I'm sure. But there is a door that has been opened. And there is a, an extraordinary possibility of walking through it, uh, which we are radically underprepared for. Let, let, let me ask you this. This is an open question, David and, and others. OK, we have the assessments come in, and the reading scores aren't strong. Now, uh, will the US history or the US government teacher uh, say, I'm not teaching reading here. I, I've got a subject matter. I, I've, I've got to meet US history standards or, or civics standards here. You're asking me to take responsibility for something that really should be the English department. I mean, how, how, do, you, how do you get that? I mean, and it's not, a, it's not a matter of uncollegiality. It's saying, I've got this material that I do have to teach. Uh, will those, will the reading scores fall upon the English teacher alone? Well, we have an early model. Uh, earlier this afternoon, New York City endorsed the core knowledge curriculum for K2. And as many of you know, the, uh, it, it was one of two endorsed curriculum. I'm less familiar with the other. But the, the core knowledge curriculum deliberately and overtly and explicitly weaves together, as you know, knowledge across disciplines to build a foundational knowledge base for children. Now, it's arguably easier to do that in the earlier grade levels. I, I understand that. And by the time you move to high school, the idea that the physics teacher or the biology teacher, right, the biology teacher is going to set uh, the voyage of the beagle, right, um, <laughs> so that, right, the, the, the Victorian history, I mean, you, you get the problem, right? It's not going to happen yet. But if we can begin with the early grades to see this idea of working across disciplines and having texts speak to each other, you mentioned it earlier, nonfiction and fiction, uh, we may be able to begin to build something that particularly for underprivileged children, and that's crucial here, uh, that begins to give them the opportunity to build a knowledge base that otherwise they don't have. Speaking of Edie Hirsch, he called uh, information, the, the term informational text a, a terrible, soulless phrase. <laughs> <laughs> but Common Core usually says nonfiction. <laughs> yes, uh, right. So, but he, he, he supports, Hirsch supports the, 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 the ELA, but it, it, it's worth noting at this point that the official name of the ELA Common Core Standards right. that we're talking about is Standards for English Language Arts and Literacy in History slash Social Studies, Science, and Technical Subjects. Now, this raises, I mean, you, you gave the positive spin to that, um, but uh, shouldn't these nonfiction texts be read in the subjects, history, science, social studies, that they belong with? And I think that's what you were getting at. I mean, is there a risk here with the ELA, Common Core as just defined, that we're going to be watering down not only our literature curriculum, but also the, the, the social studies, history, science, um, those domains? Hard to tell. I mean, we're waiting for the science standards. Right. And our first great challenge will be if we get good science standards, what happens to the science portion of the ELA standards? We've right. got like Venn diagrams, right? We'll have the science standards, the ELA standards, and there'll be this overlap. And we're going to have to manage that. Um, it so if they're teaching the Gettysburg Address in, uh, uh, in, the in, in liter liter literature course, right? what's the history? Uh, no, no. It's the idea is it would be. It can be taught, for example, most richly, I would imagine, with both teachers teaching together. Okay. 
Yeah. I mean, we, we face the same challenge at the university level. We've been very unimaginative about cross-disciplinary work, about team teaching. It's still the old model of teacher closes door, sits in box, is left alone, unsupported, isolated, <laughs> and unsurprisingly, um, often feels exactly that. And then what happens in the classroom 10 minutes after the bell rings in the next classroom is totally disconnected. Right? This is an insane way to educate. Um, but it is bureaucratically efficient, or at least it was in Taylorian terms in the beginning of the 20th century. The only problem is we still haven't changed. There are schools that are doing extraordinary work in cross-disciplinary team teaching using technology. We've just got to get off our behinds and get to work. So uh, this is, get, let's get into the classroom then. The theory of, going back to for a second, the theory of reading. We have another clip from David Coleman that I'd like to show you. It's very, it's very short, but I think it, it raises and addresses some of the issues you just addressed. And there he is. So those six shifts, you might sum them up as reading like a detective and writing like an investigative reporter. A college and career-ready student can read a range of sufficiently complex text, understand it, analyze it, make thoughtful connections between it, integrate knowledge from it, and then write about it clearly. And that's at the heart of these standards. I like the reading like a detective and writing like an investigative reporter. Yeah, I don't. That's <laughs> um, uh, that, to me, is the, the place where, and, and you know, I know that we have uh, representatives uh, on, from David's team, and I would actually say this, David was sitting here, uh, and I was privileged to host him in one of his very early presentations in Albany, and again, want to underline my admiration for so much of this work. Um, my reservation is a very local one, and it was brought up by that clip. I find, I would call that approach to reading a forensic approach. Um, it, the detective and the journalist are obviously fully legitimate ways of reading, but they scarcely exhaust the art of reading, or we used to call it hermeneutics. Um, this is a long story I'll make very short. The, the approach that's being taken here is very familiar to students of literary history because it closely parallels something called the New Criticism, which was a theory in the 1940s, mainly John Crow Ransom and others, um, who precisely as David Coleman does in many of his presentations, argued that we must go back to the text itself, forget the context, the politics, the emotional response, the aesthetic response. It's the text, the text, the text. And very frankly, I worry that that approach, that is, find what the word means, or to take the detective analogy, there's a truth to this text. Or the journalist, there's a truthful story to be found here, risks the imaginative, aesthetic element of reading. And I think will be difficult for uh, some of our most talented English teachers uh, who, who hear that. Um, great texts, Heidegger said, read us. We don't always just come to them with the scalpel, with the microscope, with the magnifying glass. I hope that there is an opportunity to have that discussion. There is nothing in the common core standards themselves that force one theory of reading. And I want to say that David Coleman is careful in his videos to say, this is an approach. Let's try it. Um, here's why I recommend it. Not all the others are out of bounds. But the risk is that our assessments will grind that single approach into the only approach, because if the assessments go only for that find the single detective truth, then that's what going to encourage, because they are rational actors, it will encourage teachers to move only in that direction. And having worked with teachers on the Common Core in the last few months, I can say that there's enormous richness to the detective and the journalist approach, but it can also get old. If it's always the same thing, right? We just decode the word meaning, we figure out you know, what this thing is, we've solved the equation. There is something scientistic about this uh, that gives me pause in between all of the other benefits. Any 
Well, I you agree. The, 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 I, I, I do agree, and th this is our shared literary background. I think that uh, reading like a detective, writing like an investigator, works in many, many ways. But uh, when one enters literary experience, when one reads Emily Dickinson poems or or uh, uh, you know, Satan's speeches in Paradise Lost, there are elements of ambiguity, of irony, of, of indeterminate meanings that you really can't fully pin down. And one of the reasons why we go back to those same texts, reread them over and over again, is because we, we, we haven't solved the case. Right? There is something still, I don't want to say haunting or mystifying or intriguing, compelling uh, about those words. When, when Emily Dickinson writes, further in summer than the birds, pathetic from the grass, a minor nation celebrates its unobtrusive mass. I can only go, I've taught that poem before, I can only go so far in, figuring, in presenting that to students. And when they say, what does this mean? I, I can't tell them, here is what this poem means. Here is the truth of this poem. I can talk about the language. I can talk about the, the sound and the rhythm and these images and, and metaphors. When, when we get done, though, with that presentation, there is still uh, something, something remaining there. I would add very quickly that, yeah. uh, and Mark and I presumably are both targets here to a charge of intellectual elitism, to a charge that we are university professors looking back. I actually think that's patronizing to students uh, and to teachers, K-12. Um, I think that English teachers know this inside them. Uh, even simple phrases, you mentioned the great Gatsby, her voice full of aching, grieving beauty spoke only of her unexpected joy. A voice of aching, grieving beauty. How much detective work can you do? Um, it, it is like the wine dark sea in Homer. It is a haunting image that you live with. Um, it is closer to music than to detective work. Uh, Schubert once played a sonata in a home and the young woman asked him, what, did it, what does that sonata mean? Upon which he played it again. Um, there is a sense in which certain analytic questions come to an end in the front of great literature. Um, and again, not to say that the, the detective and journalists don't have their place, but they don't delimit what it means to read. Just to defend Coleman a little bit on this, the close, I think uh, you should go on to Engage New York website uh, where you can see all of these fascinating discussions with Commissioner John King and David Coleman about many of these topics. And he delivers at one point a sort of a wonderful uh, um, presentation about how to, how to read the Gettysburg Address. I'm not even, it's, it's, it's better than that. But it, he then, and he sort of flushes out what he means by reading the text and not all of the context. We're running out of, I want to I want to get to one subject before we turn it over to you, and then uh, I'll ask you to be brief, but um, I'll try to be a little, I'll read very quickly. Um, my friend Robert Pondicio of, of late with the Core Knowledge Foundation uh, quoted David Coleman saying, uh, uh, by reading texts in history, social studies, science, and other disciplines, students build a foundation of knowledge in these fields that will also give them the background to be better readers in all content areas. Students can only gain this foundation when the curriculum is intentionally and coherently structured to develop rich content knowledge within and across grades. And Robert pointed out these were the most important 57 words uh, in our schools. I wrote, I don't know if Robert read this, but I wrote a little blog responding to that and said, I've got it in 20 words. And it's actually in the Common Core Standards themselves. And those 20 words are, the standards must therefore be complemented by a well-developed, content-rich cu curriculum consistent with the expectations laid out in this document. Right, but that's, that's the prayer, right? Well, that's, yeah. that's, right. that's I mean, That it. brings us back to the beginning. There we go. That, that is the, you know, in the name of God, amen. May it be so. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Any, any, any final words before we uh, turn it over to the uh, audience here? Um, we, have a, we have a mic. Please stand up. Uh, tell us who you are, and, and if you can, ask a question. We've got 
Let's wait for the mic. 50 people in that room and 30 of them took notes and we don't know. And whether we thought it was the angels or the ages kind of depends on how we view Lincoln. So I mean, I think those opportunities are out there, right? I mean, it's not, it's not an either or. I agree, I mean, I, and I, I wanted to be very clear in saying that I don't think the Common Core closes down that opportunity. I do think that the, as you read what are called the anchor standards, which are the crucial sort of mileposts, the words of evidence, 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 um, are almost like a drumbeat. And my modest concern, and I want to underline modest, is simply that that can drown out um, a, an aesthetic of the kind that I think all of us would want to keep open, and I'm sure David would too. I think there was a, a, an instinct to have this to be robust, which it must be to cross the country in 46 states and District of Columbia, um, and perhaps a concern not to leave things ambiguous um, at the level of the standards but I think there's been a small price to be paid. Let me, let me say a, a quick word about that. When, when you acknowledge the, the, the irony, the irreducibility of, of those ambiguities, we, we don't want to stop talking. That, that, I mean, one, one can see that that can turn into a form of, of genuflection before the literature, and that, that, that we, we, want to, we want to avoid that. I think the, the issue is to avoid, with the literary text, the kind of reductiveness that one often sees in reading comprehension exams, mm -hmm. where you have a passage. Question one, what is the thesis of the passage? Okay. Uh, what evidence does the author use? And that, those are legitimate questions to pose about informational texts. Many of them, but, but again, there's, the, there's this area of, of literary expression that I, I think just calls for uh, something that doesn't yield to that kind of that that kind of examination, uh, so, and, Peter, Hi, wait. Uh, can you wait for the mic? Thank you. Hi, my name is Peter Goodman. Um, I congratulate you for mentioning Tinkering Towards Utopia, which I think is sort of required reading before you uh, discuss any of this. <laughs> right. uh, and I fear that. Um, that the whole standards movement will be the subject of a lot of uh, dissertations years from now. <laughs> uh, um, Could be. Uh, Tony Bennett what, spoke about the Common Core uh, uh, this morning, and he made a, a lot of emphasis about uh, the assessment part, mm -hmm. and a lot of the fear on part of principals and teachers and parents, mm -hmm. this enormous emphasis on testing. Is the assessment part going to actually drown the Common Core? Yeah. Is it going to be so overwhelming and create such an opposition? That as Tip O'Neill said, all politics is local, and uh, it'll eventually simply dry up because there will be no funds for it anymore. The the question of assessments is open, as you know. We're waiting for uh, Park and Smarter Balance. Those are the two consortiums developing the assessments that uh, Peter mentioned. the The first released questions give one some modest hope. For example, question on Daedalus and Icarus, which was actually rather imaginative had the students look at a more modern version of the story, the, the Aesop, uh, and the very deep question, actually, about the contrast between the two passages. Now, that's a, a released sample, right? When you create assessments for hundreds upon thousands of students at each grade level, are we going to see the kind of quality that would make for support for the best aspects of the Common Core and not bringing them down. I'm nervous about this. Um, this is not confidential in any way. My fellow commissioners uh, are working, I think, with some nervousness. Uh, Chancellor Tisch mentioned this morning at the event that you and I attended that New York very much has Plan B, right, that is developing its own Common Core-aligned assessments. In case Park, the consortium New York is in, uh, isn't able to deliver either on time or at quality. So it's not like folks are taking anything for granted. I think there is a general sense of how important this is and what a gamble we're taking that the tests will be very different from some of the weak tests that we've had 
to deal with before. As you know, that was very much part of, of what I faced, um, evidence that the tests had become inflationary and narrowed and were not helping teachers and were not helping students. So I can't sit here and pretend that I'm super confident. I'm just hoping for the best. Thank you. I'm Eric Koch. I'm the Dean of Arts and Sciences at Hunter College and uh, a professor of French when I have time to date. Uh, and thank you both very much for your uh, extremely rich remarks. I wanted to uh, return to um, a theme of yours, Professor Bauerlein, um, that you broached in your opening remarks, which is one that uh, um, you know is a very important theme for me too, namely the value of the literary humanities in uh, pre-college curricula and in college curricula too. Uh, which seems to be under attack, or the sense is certainly that it's under attack. Um, but I, I think that it's also given us a chance to think, and perhaps for many of us for the first time, about what the value uh, of literary humanities are. Um, and uh, I'd like to invite you to uh, to articulate the importance of um, in, in sound bites, of course. Uh, <laughs> of, One minute, brother. <laughs> of uh, reading. Uh, thinking and writing about literature. And you both have touched on this already. You've reminded us about that, that words have history, uh, that every text has rhetorical depth. But could you, could you make that case briefly? You, you know, maybe, maybe I'll just put it historically. Certainly, the humanities have to justify themselves more vigorously than ever before in, in more and more in higher education. Uh, and it's just an odd position for for people, I think, in the humanities, because we take it so much for granted, the, the, it, uh, how important it is. And we thought the culture felt this way as well. If you go back to the 1950s, for instance, the novel, the American novel, stood as one of the central expressions of the American experience, of American values, of, of, of big issues. The, the, the novel was was, uh, was a place you would go to understand things, just as much as you went to a sociological work or a philosophical work. I mean, if you wanted to understand atheism, you would just as well read you know, Bertrand Russell on atheism and, and Dostoevsky. You'd read the Brothers Karamazov to understand atheism. And you, just, you just sort of accepted that. And, and I think we have, we have lost that. My you know, easy example is Johnny Carson used to have novelists on his The Tonight Show all the time. Can, can you imagine Jay Leno <laughs> having and spending 10 minutes with, with, with another? There's a great clip of on the Steve Allen show. Pardon? He, well, he, he, he does, he does. I, I well, that, that, that's another. <laughs> so, so does Col Stephen Colbert. But the, the uh, you know, Steve Allen ha had, a, had a Tonight Show. And there's a great clip of Jack Kerouac in 1959 sure. coming on the show. Steve Allen is playing his little jazz uh, riffs. And Kerouac is reading from one of his books at the piano, <laughs> reciting. And Steve Allen turns four minutes over to Kerouac reciting. This, but, but this, this is unimaginable today. So I, I think it's a broad cultural problem of literary, literary culture, literary audiences, uh, trying to fend off all these other pressures. My, my father, who has dedicated his whole life to teaching literature and after 27 books or whatever, announced to me that um, it was completely hubristic to worry about the humanities. They've had 23 good centuries. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, I, think, bad I, I think that, that to some degree he's right. Uh, we are in trouble. Uh, there are so many other forms beckoning to young people that simply weren't there before. But I also, uh, and Mark and I may differ a little bit about this, I, I resist the sort of golden age idea. Um, when you take it apart, fewer people ever had the chance to go to college. We were trying to educate fewer. Um, the idea that somehow it was always better. Um, since the ancient Greeks and probably before, every generation has said the education was better in my day. 
<laughs> this cannot be true. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, human progress would be over. So um, we love our books, and may the Common Core begin to return us to some of the texts. Yeah. Thank you for your comments. Uh, I, I'm a graduate student in the TESOL program. And uh, one thing that has been missing tonight from this conversation is uh, how it affects English learners. And uh, at the moment, um, I'm doing some field work and I'm also in a curriculum class where we're working with the Common Core Standards. And I don't profess to be an expert on it, but from what I've seen of it, uh, I, it seems to be you have different texts uh, assigned to certain grades. This, uh, this poem, uh, this document, and, and by the way, I will say something in its favor, uh, that there are historical tie-ins uh, with poetry and literature, which I think is very good. The thing that I find disturbing, though, is uh, it was said before that there is um, a culture in the United States that mitigates against a one-size-fits-all, mm -hmm. but the way it was explained to me was, yes, you could teach materials other than what's in the core curriculum, uh, but by the way, uh, these materials and these grades are going to be on the assessment. So uh, you wind up teaching to the test. Uh, utopianism was mentioned before. Um, how does this not become, number one, educational dictatorship, one size fits all, and number two, how do you get English learners to fit into this thing uh, without um, losing uh, their ability to learn the language. Uh, you, know, you have kids that come yeah, right off the we, boat. Yeah. You know, they, they don't graduate in right. four years. They graduated so, six. So yeah. very quickly. Explain common. I think that's the... Well, no, the very we quickly, the, the English language learner and special education are two issues where, the, where New York State said, uh-uh, there's not enough. Um, in the Common Core. Yeah. Under the original agreements the states made, a certain percentage was left to the states. And New York State used its freedom, if you will, to put it that way, to add elements specifically for ELA and special education. And I'm sure that uh, my successor, John King, uh, will sustain and grow that effort because we have an enormous ELL challenge. Now, that said, um, ELL students, as you know, given enough time in New York City, outperform the average native students. Um, this is not about dumbing down anything. This is actually about professional development of teachers and time. Right? The, the problem, if you put somebody in front of a test that is supposed to represent you know, 14 years of growing up in the United States and speaking English, and they got off the boat two months ago, right? what do you expect? So, I think this is a policy issue um, as much as it is an exam issue. On the, on the sort of authoritarianism of, of, of the test and so forth and so on, I think what we've tried to say tonight is if anything, the content is underspecified, not overspecified. Right now, the Common Core is largely about skills and makes what I suggested were whatever gestures it could to content. So I don't think there's much content uh, the authoritarianism, I think there's, if anything, not enough. Yeah. Unfortunately, you, 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 you have text exemplars, but they're just right. recommended. That's right. Unfortunately, we're, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, Morat, yeah, yeah. we'll give you 30 seconds to uh, uh, final, final comments, and we've, we've, we're out of time. Um, you get a 30, I'm sorry, what, oh, am I being said, okay, we, we've just extended time. Well, <laughs> quickly. Uh, Hi, I'm Michael Holquist, and I'm a retired teacher. Um, I uh, think that uh, this has been a wonderful discussion, and uh, a very civilized about a topic that is, is horrifying. Uh, what uh, concerns me a little bit is the idea that uh, we, the humanities, are under attack. They've always been under attack, a kind of, of confidence that past performance of the humanities will guarantee us that we'll get through the challenge that these uh, that, that are, is now being made. 
the uh, common core standards are based on the ideology not only of testing, but of information. It's all about information theory, not semantics. It goes back, I, I, it, 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 it's part of, of, of the, the, the downside of the, the digital revolution, where everything can be reduced to uh, pattern recognition, not idiosyncrasy. And the, the kind of challenge that that, that larger context raises to uh, the ability to teach literature in the way that, that uh, one would like to see it uh, taught, and which is done as great as you would like to see it taught tonight, it, uh, it becomes much more fraught than, than that is yeah. the case. And the, the testing, I mean, the, it, it's one thing to talk about the detective uh, uh, aspect of teaching literature. It's another thing to take into account the detective aspect of testing sure. for those skills. That, that, yeah. That's yeah, I spoke of that, but I think, again, I resist the idea that there's a golden age that the, the Common Core standards are coming to shut down. Um, there is, if the Common Core standards help us to work with teachers to return the careful and slow reading of primary sources, be they fiction and nonfiction, they will have done an enormous service. I do not think, and I, I had the privilege of looking at a number of classrooms when I uh, was commissioner and I saw some extraordinary teaching. I also saw places where <coughs> teachers simply hadn't been prepared and the texts were not visible in the classroom. So rather than um, sort of say it's not everything we yet want, that we want to complicate the role of detective and journalist, we want to aestheticize, we want to m make it more, uh, make it richer. Uh, let's start by just getting some text back into the classroom. I'm gonna give Mark 30 seconds if you could sum up whatever you think the best takeaway is, and then David, you can say yeah, thank you. The, the solution is... <laughs> <laughs> Become a detective. To I'm actually gonna give you a solution to divide English into two classes, I think. I mean, now the logistics, I'm not gonna worry about, I'm an academic, I don't worry about it. So, uh, but, but the, I think the simple thing is to divide the, the reading and writing skills off as a separate, uh, a, a separate study and leave literary, historical, traditional English study uh, as, as, a, as a separate domain. And be, because uh, it, it seems like English is simply going to be asked to do too much. Uh, it, it's, it's going to be responsible for too much of the skills, which Common Core itself says wants to be cross-curricular, uh, transdisciplinary skills. This should be, I think, an independent, uh, an independent class. So. Uh, I want to thank Mark, who's a, a, an old colleague of mine, and uh, I was privileged to, to work with him, as I say, some years ago, and always find him as tonight to be extraordinarily thoughtful on these issues, to thank Kida uh, for conducting the conversation and thank each of you. This is the beginning of multiple conversations. I say the next one will involve teachers and um, what's going on in the schools. Uh, this is the beginning of a long journey and thank you for being with us at the start. Thank you. Thank you. Good work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you, Mark.